Uh, welcome everyone to the Equal Opportunities Committee. It's the 12th meeting of 2014 and can ask everyone just to set your electronic devices to flight mode or off, please. Today's first agenda is an item, um, an evidence session on female genital mutilation. And we'll start the session with some introductions. At the table, we have our clerking team and research team, official reporters, and broadcasting services. And around the room, we're also supported by the security officers. And welcome to the lady in the public gallery as well. My name is Margaret McCulloch, and I'm the convener of the committee. And I'll now invite members and witnesses to introduce themselves. And could I ask the witnesses, um, when you're doing so, just to explain your roles as well, please? And starting here on my right. Good morning. I'm Marco Biaggi. I'm the MSP for Edinburgh Central and Deputy Convener of the Committee. Hi, I'm Siobhan McMahon, MSP for Central Scotland. Hey, John Mason, MSP for Glasgow Shettleston. Good morning. Christian Allard, MSP for North East Scotland. Alec Johnston, Member for North East Scotland. And Van Morning, John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. Good morning. I'm Willie Gill, Detective Superintendent with Police Scotland. I was recently promoted uh, in March into a new role within uh, the Specialist Crime Division of Police Scotland and have a national responsibility for child and adult protection. Prior to that role, I was a Detective Chief Inspector in charge of the Public Protection Unit in Edinburgh, so I have a background in, in child protection. Good morning, I'm Nadine Alian. I work with the Police Scotland as well. I'm in the National Safer Communities Department of the Specialist Crime Division. and We deal with hate crime, we deal with community tensions, community engagement, and we're also responsible for the quality and diversity outcomes for Police Scotland. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start the, the questions. And first of all, congratulations on your promotion and your role as well. Um, in your written submission, you actually state that since April 2013, there have been 14 referrals submitted to Police Scotland relating to 16 children at risk of FGM. Can you give us some background on how these referrals um, would have been dealt with Police Scotland and also what your training policy is as well, please. In terms of the background to the referrals, we very much view uh, female genital mutilation as a child protection issue. Um, the referrals that have come into Police Scotland um, have been dealt with uh, in line with our child protection procedures. Um, so each one will be assessed on a multi-agency basis. Uh, a discussion will take place with local authority social workers, uh, uh, police officers who are trained to undertake uh, child protection discussions of that nature. Uh, and the, there will also be a communication with uh, health to, to get the background on the, the child uh, involved. And then after a decision is taken on a multi-agency basis, what's the, the most appropriate way to um, progress that referral? So there's a number of outcomes from that. And one of the first things to determine, is it child protection or not? So that decision is made at that uh, discussion. And it's commonly referred to as an inter-agency inter referral discussion. Um, and we follow the, the national guidance um, for child protection in regards, uh, with regards to that. In terms of training, um, we've rolled out significant amounts of training uh, to, to frontline officers and specialist officers on uh, honour-based violence, forced marriage and uh, female genital mutilation. Um, we have a, a honour-based violence, uh, forced marriage and female genital mutilation detective sergeant who performs a coordination role and also delivers training um, to officers um, at various st stages throughout their service. There's probationary inputs given to officers at the Scottish Police College and there's also inputs given to specialist officers, for example, on domestic abuse courses, on senior investigating officers courses um, and a variety of other uh, national courses. We also organise awareness raising through uh, an annual conference uh, that's held in December each year, um, which covers all uh, um, HBV, forced marriage and uh, uh, female genital mutilation. So um, we recognise that it's an ongoing issue. Actually, it's not a one-off event for us training 
needs to continue as new officers come into the service, as we understand more about um, female genital mutilation, and we recognise that awareness raising uh, must continue within Police Scotland, and, and we do that. Oh, I mean, I'm assuming that the 16 children at risk that was reported to you, there was no action taken, is that correct? No, there was action taken on a multi-agency basis, so there, there would be a number of actions taken. For example, there would be um, you know, a joint visit with a social worker and a police officer to the house, or potentially um, a joint visit between a so social worker and a health visitor to assess the risk and get a real sense of what is going on uh, in that uh, child and family's life. And the view is, and the key priority is, is to prevent uh, or reduce the risk of that, that child being uh, subjected uh, to FGM. I don't know if I'm allowed to ask this or not, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Was any of the children actually had, had FGM actually um, done to them? No. No? No, so, is, is yeah. the answer. It is a sensitive area, mm -hmm. but um, no, the... There, there were no cases identified. And, and I think that's one of the things to stress on where we are in terms of referrals for uh, FGM. Most of the referrals have been made about a concern or a risk of FGM. And, and key to that is the preventative approach to stop um, FGM occurring. So, so most of the referrals have been yeah. concerns. Have you had any experience of young children or uh, teenagers actually having this actually done to them at all? Has anybody reported it actually been done to them? Yeah, of the referrals that we had since Police Scotland, um, th there was one referral that indicated that there was a suspicion that it had occurred um, and again child protection procedures were followed. However, that was uh, fully investigated and, and it was ascertained that in, a, in actual effect, it was a false alarm. Um, there, there has been one case that I am aware of uh, that was prior to Police Scotland where I believe that there, there was a concern about a, a child having actually been subjected to, to FGM. Uh, do you think you've got enough resources to actually tackle the problem? The resources, um, actually, we don't understand the, the problem. We don't understand the extent of... FGM in Scotland. Um, if you look at the statistics that are reported to the police, arguably, um, and this is not my view, but people could say that there is not a problem in Scotland. There's a, you know, with the low uh, numbers of referrals. Uh, so we don't understand the problem till, till we increase reporting, fully understand the prevalence of uh, female genital mutilation in our society within Scotland. Then it's very difficult to say. Have we got sufficient resources or not? In terms of broader child protection, uh, in terms of the number of referrals we have, then we are adequately resourced to deal with those referrals. Do you think that other agencies are hesitant to actually um, report concerns they've actually got to you about children maybe actually having the FGM done to them? Our sense is, is that there is a, a lack of referrals coming in about female genital mutilation. And I, I think historically and currently, there's probably a number of barriers to that um, reporting pr uh, process. How, how, how would you suggest you actually change those um, attitudes and fears and concerns from those organisations? Because at the end of the day, it is actually child abuse. And if it was another form of child abuse, then agencies would m be more keen to actually act upon it? Absolutely. I think you've hit the nail on the head. It is clearly uh, child abuse and serious child abuse at that. Um, we need to uh, uh, emphasise that to all practitioners where there is a risk of female genital mutilation, then we need to follow child protection procedures and we need to gain confidence within the third sector agencies that um, we will deal with any referrals in a sensitive manner in line with child protection procedures um, and, and follow the investigation through. Thank you very much. Um, can I pass you on to John Finney now, please? Thank you, Irina. Good morning and thanks very much indeed for, for the written evidence. Uh, I'm greatly reassured from what I, I read about the approach that's been adopted by Police Scotland. And I, I know Police Scotland, like ourselves, will be awaiting the Scottish Refugee Council 
scoping exercise with, with great interest. I, I also note you talk about a, an awareness raising conference. Um, the most refreshing thing I heard you say, and people may be surprised, is we don't understand the problem, because I think that is the, the key to this issue. And I wonder um, if you'd like to comment on how we're likely to understand more about it, because uh, um, it will require attitudinal changes, because, and, and for any law to have uh, buy-in from the public, they must understand that there's something wrong. So what role do you see for the police in trying to shape attitudinal changes? within my role in the social communities department I think one of the barriers that definitely exists and I see it in amongst officers is almost a fear of dealing with things when there's diversity and cultural issues so um, people are probably scared to either upset or be seen as racist whatever it might be because you know it, just, it tends to be black minority ethnic communities that are involved in this process so certainly from a national civic community department for our own staff we're, we're constantly trying to develop new training to, to see that Yes, we have to, wherever we can, adhere to cultural and, and acknowledge them and respect them, but that should not come in the way of any police investigation. So that's something that my department are constantly trying to, to reiterate, that yes, we, it's important to acknowledge cultural and faith issues, but when it comes to likes of this, that this takes precedence over or upsetting anyone's you know, issues with, in terms of culture or faith. I only ask, and following on from that line, um, it's not necessarily a personal view, but is there a difficulty the link with honour-based violence and forced marriage? Does that presume a certain customer base, for want of a better? I don't think there's a, a difficulty. I mean, I think we're absolutely c committed to challenging all aspects of honour-based violence. Um, and, and we've done that through awareness raising and training, and, and, and we've got to... Con I perhaps didn't explain that, but I, I mean, as an organisational thing from the police, the fact that these issues are so closely linked, where they might not, I mean, we're just dealing with one aspect of yes. that, FGM. Would it be perceived as, you know, the police dealing certainly just with the, the ethnic minority community, the linkage with these three issues? Because in some respects, they're perhaps unrelated. Um, I think I'm struggling a bit with your we understand your question, to, to, to be honest. Okay. Um, you have the same staff dealing with all three of these issues, okay, yes. yeah, and and there are sensitivities about all of them, yes. yeah. But we are particularly focused on the issue um, involving young people here. Um, um, are people less likely to come forward if they think there's going to be um, issues regarding marriage that's going to be looked at as well as issues regarding the children? I'm just wondering if uh, I'm thinking about possible barriers to people coming forward. Um, well, that's a, I, 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 don't, I don't think so. I mean, in terms of Police Scotland, we've got to ensure that our relationship with communities, that we get the message out that, that actually we're all about protecting people and we want to protect people, we want to protect the most vulnerable people in our societies. So therefore, if anybody comes forward to Police Scotland to, to report any kind of honour-based violence, then we've got to ensure and we will ensure that we treat it sensitively we listen to their concerns, we work with them, we engage with partners in the third sector to provide support, offer referrals uh, to the, the individuals involved. But fundamentally, what we must do is reduce the risk to, to, to those individuals, be it child or adult, um, and, and we will do that. I ask if there's any liaison with uh, police authorities abroad, for instance, in the countries where there is a prevalence of FGM. Um, what, 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 we, what we are doing is looking at good practice uh, around the world. Uh, um, we've, you know, you know, personally, I've done a, a bit of research, um, not in depth, I have to say, but to, to, to look at you know, uh, what's happening in France. I think Kenya at the moment, there's been a drop in uh, FGM cases reported, albeit there's been not a great number of prosecutions, as I understand it, in Kenya, more prosecutions in France, and I think Holland is held up as a model, although I've not had an opportunity to study the, the Dutch response in detail. Um, we also sit on an ACPO committee uh, with our colleagues in England on the wider issue of child abuse. Finally, in, in relation to liaison with other organisations, we, we, we've been told of a, um, the Border Force Metropolitan Police Service National Crime Agency carrying out an an initiative, it says here, 
an initiative at UK airports. Were you involved in that at all, the Scottish Police Service? We weren't directly involved in that. However, our strategic um, honour based violence force management uh, FGM working group, we have a detective superintendent who is in charge of uh, the Border Command in terms of policing for, for Scotland. And it's certainly something we're looking at initiatives. We've rolled out training actually previously to staff, police staff within um, within a number of airports in Scotland. Uh, and that's something we're looking to continue doing. And we've also been asked by partner agencies within uh, airports to, to consider uh, offering training uh, along with third partner, uh, third sector agencies to deliver training to um, uh, uh, employees of airports, so it's ongoing. Also on that, I'm with Mr Crawford, who heads up the, the Borders um, Command, I've set up a consultation group in Edinburgh Airport and Aberdeen Airport, and that's made up of a group of lay people um, with access through local equality councils. Um, and the, the whole aim of that group is to have a two-way process whereby We've already done some training, in fact, on human trafficking. For example, FGM is on the agenda, as is force marriage, and uh, staff training as well with Police Scotland and other agencies that work at the airport. So very new, those two groups, but the idea is, as the name suggests, a quality uh, consultation group is to um, update these people from the communities to, for them to then feed back. So just little things like, for example, the body scanners, things that, that are that there's myths about in terms of uh, that upset various communities or are, are seen as... Um, contrary to their culture of faith. So they're in the early stages, but they're, they're developing and we'll certainly introduce FGM as a training um, issue for them as well. There's no issue with information sharing across the UK between agencies and that on this vital issue? Certainly not within, within the, the police service and local authorities. We, we, we liaise and, and also you know, locally and nationally with our th third sector uh, partners. OK, thanks very much indeed. Can I just briefly come in before, on this before I hand you over to Christian? When you're talking about sharing uh, information, uh, one of the witnesses uh, we actually spoke to in a previous session spoke about the idea that England was looking at like a, a card, a kind of a medical card, that when the families take the young girl out of the country back to their homeland, that the card actually confirms that girl actually hasn't had FGM uh, imposed upon her. And the girl was actually saying that when they then show that to the family back there and they say, look, if we bring the, the daughter back and she's actually been mutilated with FGM, then we will be imprisoned, we will, we will be criminals and then we won't be able to actually send you money um, to help to support you. And she was saying this has actually been quite effective. Have you heard of that at all? I've not heard of that in any, any great detail, but I think any initiatives that we can uh, employ are certainly worth uh, con considering, so I, I'd be interested to find more out uh, about that. Yeah. See if you do find more yeah. about it, could you report back to us and give us some more information then? Certainly. Excellent. Yeah. And I apologise, it's not Christian, it's actually John Mason that's next to ask your question. Okay. Hey, I thought I was getting missed out there. Um, thanks very much, convener. Um, I mean, following on really from John Finney's kind of line of questioning, that there's clearly a balance to be struck between building up relationships with the community and, well, enforcing the law, I suppose, at one end, but, I mean, also protection, as you've said yourself. And, I mean, presumably that, that actually applies to all communities in one sense. But, I mean, how do you get that balance right between the two? I've got to be clear, this is an absolutely abhorrent practice and it is a criminal practice. So, where there is evidence of... Uh, such a serious crime being committed, that takes precedence and we must investigate that thoroughly. And if there is a sufficiency of evidence, then we need to be absolutely clear people will be reported to the procurator fiscal. So I think that's, the, 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 from the policing pers uh, perspective, that, that is our fundamental position. However, there's a whole other agenda, and a, a, an equally important agenda is about prevention, and it's about attitudinal change. So we recognise that is important, and, and that's you know fundamentally what child protection is about. So therefore, it's I can I see it as a continuum, a continuum of risk. But actually, when a child has been subjected to that brutal assault, then action needs to be taken, and I think that's right and proper. I mean, you talk about continuum, which is quite a good word. I mean, 
so presumably the other organisations are part of that continuum as well. I mean, it, would the emphasis be really that maybe either third sector or like schools and things would emphasise more building up the relationships and then the police are there to do a bit more of the enforcement if, if that kind of action is needed? Yeah, and I, I think actually, although the enforcement is important, it's important in the context that can be done in an asset, you know, in a, a thorough and a sensitive uh, manner. So it's, it's not necessarily heavy-handed enforcement, but actually it's thorough, it's professional, and it's accountable. And I think that's really important. And in doing that, I think you can gain, uh, hopefully, attitudinal change, gain support within affected communities for change. But actually, that bit on its own is only one part of that jigsaw. I mean, if if we think enforcement is the key, is going to solve the problem, uh, you know, of, of, of FGM, I think we're mistaken. It's a far wider issue that, than that. It is one important aspect of the bigger jigsaw. So we need all to come together, and with all, all agencies involved in child protection, I've got a, a part and a role to play in that. For me as well. I, just, I think it's important, again, we, we reiterate this through our critical incident training that's ongoing at the Scottish Police College, whereby we can't just go to these communities in times of crisis or in times of conflict. We have to build positive relationships, engage with them in the good times as well as the more difficult times. And that's something that we do through, again, local engagement, through our local policing plans to make sure we're not just going there to end in force all the time. So through school link officers, through a whole variety of engagement processes, third part reporting centres are springing up around the country um, to support what's already there. We're trying to build that trust and confidence so that they're more likely to come to us. Um, but also, if we need to go to them to deal with a difficult issue like FGM, they're more likely to trust us and, and hopefully come forward with it. I mean, how would you assess at the moment the, the tr level of trust and confidence with minority communities? I mean, my guess is that it probably varies between communities. And I mean, clearly we've had a, a large Pakistani community for a long time in Scotland and now you have people from that community in the police and I, I'm guessing the relationship there is, is, is getting quite strong but we've got other groups who maybe just within the last few years have come in from maybe some of the African countries and I, I would be right in assuming that that relationship's only starting? Yeah, no, it's a constant challenge um, for Police Scotland, the, the changing communities, and that's what the local policing aspect is absolutely vital through. It should be a continuous pr a process of engagement, of gathering concerns, but also a continuing mapping the communities, who's coming in, who's, you know, who's coming into, the, into our communities. For example, the Somalian community in, um, through in Glasgow, there's quite a, a big Somalian community there. Um, the the criminalisation of CAT that's coming up at the end of this month we're constantly trying, you know, these are new things for us as well, and communities are seen, you know, they perceive things as, as targeting against their, their community, so we're constantly trying to, one, understand and map who people are and where they are, then what their needs are, and then through engagement, through public perception surveys, through, again, being creative in terms of how we engage as well, through social media, for, for perhaps more younger people, we have to constantly try and refurbish the way we, we, we engage with people and, and make sure we feed that into policing plans, and that's reflected through work with our partners as well. Does that uh, impact on you know how you allocate officers to particular areas? I mean, do you put more women into certain areas because perhaps some of the community are more comfortable with women? I don't we have the luxury to actually target as such. So for example, if there's a large Polish community, yes, there are some Polish officers, but we can't target as that. But we, we, they are, we have a, a pool of officers that we can use, for example, for interpreting translating if it's a, an urgent matter, things like that. But it's, it's yes, we try and make sure that all our officers and staff have a good awareness of different communities, but it's difficult, it's a challenge, they're constantly changing. Um, but we also use, for example, when we don't know all the answers, which is, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the time with, with difficult issues perhaps, we have community lay advisors. So, for example, our department's just set up a strategic um, advisory group, a bit like the, the IEGs that are down in uh, APO in England and Wales, made up of a, a variety of communities, whether it's black minority ethnic, transgender, LGBT, whatever it might be, and um, they were just recently established, and the likes of our policies and procedures to do with FGM, that's the sort of group that we go to, to for them to then feed back to their communities to, to ascertain if we've got the right approach. So there's a whole host of tactics we try to employ to make sure we're on the right lines, but we're aware, as you say, continuum is it's constantly changing, so it is a challenge. We can't target specifically officers in certain areas necessarily, but we do offer, wherever we can, special um, arrangements. So, for example, if the reporting online, there's a, a, a part that says, do you have any special requirements? And that might be a female officer. It might be, you know, to make a report out with a police station. So we try, wherever we can, to meet the needs of these sort of special requirements. Thanks very much. Um, 
Mark Obiad, you would now like to ask you some questions. Thank you. One of the things that's been pointed to sometimes by commentators is the lack of actual arrests in Scotland and until recently south of the border as well. How important do you think that is in order to be seen to be taking this seriously? And how much would it be tokenism if an arrest was simply to be done for the, the, the sake of, of addressing those concerns? won't be done for tokenism. Arrests will be carried out when there's a sufficiency of evidence to arrest people. Um, and we're absolutely committed to tackling female genital mutilation. Um, I think it is important, I think, you know, having a criminal law that says this abhorrent practice is criminal, I think that that is very, very important. I think what we've now got to do as a society is increase our understanding, increase our reporting, uh, increase our child protection referrals, and with those actions, and increase our engagement with affected communities and gain trust, with those steps, I think we will have further reporting, greater opportunity to investigate these abhorrent practices, and greater opportunity to gain evidence to hold those criminals accountable for their actions. One of the things that's been suggested in evidence so far is the, and which has come up already, is the, the difficulty of getting essentially family members to, to criminalise each other. Now, that must also be the case for reporting of other forms of child abuse. Other than the cultural sensitivities, are there any particular issues with that in the context of FGM, or is it the, the cultural issue that makes it different from child abuse more generally? I, I think that it's seen as a taboo subject. It's within within communities. I don't think it's openly discussed. I think there's challenges, and, and you, you're absolutely right, challenges that exist in a whole range of, kind of interfamilial crimes that are reported. Um, but there are challenges about f uh, loyalties, uh, mixed emotions, fear, actually disempowerment of uh, young girls and their ability to to come forward to services. There's a whole range of barriers that we need to, to overcome. I think in terms of FGM, because it's an entrenched practice in, in, in uh, affected communities, and, and I think you know some of the some of the commentators go back to say it's existed for 2,000 or more years. It's thoroughly entrenched. Now, that is a significant challenge. Um, but we must face that challenge as a society within Scotland and overcome it by working together and actually clearly labelling this as child abuse and child protection. How would you expect to hear of a potential case? I mean, you've got those examples of where you have had the referrals, so... What were the sources? Were they the young people themselves? Interestingly, the, the sources have come from a range of concerned individuals. They've come uh, from school. Um, they've come via local authority. They've come uh, via uh, um, NHS. And they've come actually from, from uh, parents on occasion. So there's just now, although it's a really small number, there is a there's a mixed pattern. And actually that's what we see in child protection more you, you know, generally. So it's very difficult actually for a young child to disclose immediately to, to a, a police officer. It's far more likely that that risk will come to someone else's attention. And that's where we need to absolutely be clear of our responsibilities of identifying the risks associated with female genital mutilation and have procedures in place that we can identify as child protection and refer it on uh, so that child protection procedures can be followed. All of those cases were incidents where children were at risk rather than had actually had it happen after the event. If there, if there was to be a, a case that came to your attention after the event, then presumably there would be investigation and potentially prosecution. Absolutely. That, that, you know, I, I kind of see four areas um, of 
or, or four categories, really. We, we have a situation where we have an adult who suffered female genital mutilation. Now, that, that adult has been subjected to, in my view, a horrific assault. Um, that person potentially is the victim of a crime, depending on when it happened and where it happened. So we've got to have supportive services round about that person. We then have an adult who has been subjected to uh, FGM who becomes pregnant. Now, it's not to say that that adult is going to go out and commit FGM on their, 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 their child. But actually, we've got to identify that that is a risk factor. And that risk has got to be thoroughly assessed and taken account of. And that risk will shift, perhaps, throughout that child's uh, life. We then have a situation where we have children who are at risk from FGM, and that's clearly uh, child protection and needs addressed. And th th the final category that I consider is actually where we have a child that um, we are aware of has suffered FGM, and again, that's child protection and requires to be met with a, a criminal investigation response to that. I presume since there have been no arrests or you haven't mentioned them before, that there haven't been any examples of after the event no. FGM drawn to your attention in the last year? Uh, not in the last year, yeah. yes. Um, the, there are changes happening to, to legislation south of the border uh, to, to cover habitual as well as permanent residents. Is that something you're aware of? And uh, I assume you're aware of it. What, what are your views on the effect of that with regard to all of these areas that I just asked about? That closes a gap in, in, in the law, actually. So I think it strengthens the law, and we would welcome that. And that should happen more widely? Um, in terms of Scotland, yeah. and the, yes, I, th yeah. I think the legislation yeah. um, should change to close that gap in the law. And do you think people are aware of the current laws sufficiently? You know, all, all of this that we've talked about? I, 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 I Especially, as, I, I don't so much mean amongst the communities, I mean amongst the, the public sector and, and the, the teachers and the NHS workers and all of that that you mentioned. I, that think, make the referrals. I think previous research and information would indicate that there's further work to be done in that area. And, and I, I think within the police as well, we cannot be complacent. We have devoted resources and we've devoted training, but actually it's an on, it's a, it is ongoing um, and we've got to continue uh, that work. And um, I'll pass you over to Christian now to ask some questions. Thank you very much, Convena. Uh, I would like to go back to the prosecution. Um, by the way, the first prosecution in England was Earl Wells for alleged FGM being earlier this year. But the media is talking about it. We, we hear during our inquiry that the media from time to time even put it on the front page. And now we've got some political attention because, of course, the committee is looking after it. Uh, do you feel under pressure to make more prosecutions? Uh, I, I think I, I don't think we feel under pressure to make pro more prosecutions. I think what we need to do is absolutely treat this as a child protection matter and investigate cases that are reported to the police as a child protection matter in partnership. And where there is evidence, we will report. Uh, to, to, to the procureur fiscal. I think that is our role. So I don't see it as a pr pressure. I see more of a... I see the, the pressure, actually. The pressure is on us, not just the police, but on us as a society to address the challenge of FGM, um, you know, in all aspects. So I, as a society within Scotland, I strongly feel that, that we need to rise that challenge and, and clearly send out a strong message that is unacceptable in Scotland. Welcome the pressure to address the problem. The, the, the pressure and the media attention round about <laughs> female genital uh, mutilation is welcome because yeah. it, it is a problem and we need to address it. But, but a pressure directed only on prosecution, would you welcome the same thing? Uh, no, no. I, I think I've said before, prosecution is only one element. It is a, an important element. And actually, when there is uh, opportunities to report cases to the procurator fiscal, we must do that vigorously, thoroughly, and professionally, and, and we must we must do that. There's there's no excuse for not doing that. So we welcome uh, any opportunity that we get to protect any child that is at risk of female genital mutilation. If uh, a case is reported to us, 
um, we will thoroughly investigate that. So we, we welcome that opportunity and we would encourage, actively encourage uh, any person within our society that has any information that FGM has been practised or, or there is a child at risk to come forward and report that to the police um, or to, to other um, other agencies with a view to it being progressed as a child protection matter. So we actually welcome the attention on female gen genital mutilation because we feel it is an issue that needs to be addressed. Did you have that discussion with your colleagues down south in the community you were talking about, about that pressure from media or that political pressure? Is it part of the discussion that you're having? I have not had that discussion, um, but it's certainly something I'll pick up on following the, this, this meeting and, and, and perhaps engage in, in discussion round about that. Okay. And what about, if I change the subject, what about the good example? You talked about good example, uh, good practices, and the convener talked about one. Is there any good practices that you've seen in your research that we've not talked about yet in this committee from other countries? Um, I think it's very hard to judge because I, I think actually that there's a number of areas where, for example, I think France has had over 100 prosecutions now. Um, we, you have to look at the legal system in France, you have to look at a whole range of uh, issues and how they got to that position. And, and, and I would have to do further work actually to determine actually where is the good practice. Um, and, and I think there's, there's an argument to say certainly globally um, that, that our efforts against the FGM are, are, are still failing because it is reported internationally that um, children are subject, still being subjected to this ab abhorrent practice. So I think it's actually a bit early to talk about good practice. I think what we've got to do I is to identify effective practice um, from not just in Scotland but around the world. Uh, within Scotland, I think we have strong child protection procedures. Female genital uh, mutilation is a child protection matter. So if we can ensure that we get referrals into our child protection process, then we can deal with that in the context of child protection and the procedures that we have. So um, I, I think there are robust child protection procedures, and it's just about we need to, to, to fill in some gaps in reporting. So we shouldn't focus so much on, on, the, on the prosecution, but more focus on the work that the agencies are doing and what the, what the we, police we, are doing we should, in different countries. Prosecution, as, as I said before, yeah. is a vital part of the overall jigsaw. Um, and it's the role of the police to investigate thoroughly and where there is evidence, report that to the Procurator Fiscal. And we are absolutely committed to doing that. Can help on the research, maybe translating some of the French uh, <laughs> research that you are doing, but it would be good to share if you've got any, any research with the committee. That would be excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, John, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Something just occurred to me um, th th there just now, and it is... There's sometimes, as I understand, the tension that can exist between the, the police service and social services about the responsibilities, and it is that balance between, you know, um, enforcing a, a, a law uh, about heinous crime, <clears throat> visited on a child, and the well-being of the child. Is that a balance that is, I imagine, is particularly pertinent to these sort of cases, FGM? Uh, I mean, the interests of the child will always be paramount in this. Uh, absolutely. I, I think you put the nail on the head there, actually. It's about protection of the child, the welfare of the child, and reducing risk. There, there are cl clearly um, you know, different roles and different responsibilities, but there is a c collective understanding with, uh, within child protection that we work together. And actually, we all have our own uh, collective, we all have our individual responsibilities, but we have a, a collective responsibility as well. And in general terms, in child protection, it's my view that, that we, work, we work pretty well with our, with our partners. I mean, Detective Superintendent, there, there wouldn't, I mean, not that I would imagine in any case that this would be the case, there would be no tokenism. That might mean that on occasions when there is a sufficiency of evidence, if it's not in the interests of the child, a prosecution wouldn't take place. That would be a matter for the Procurator Fiscal. It would be our job to report, thoroughly investigate and report the facts to the uh, Procurator Fiscal. So it, it, it wouldn't be about tokenism, I, I can assure you of that. It would be about thorough professional investigation and where there is evidence, uh, a sufficient, sufficiency of evidence that will be reported to the Procurator Fiscal. Um, alongside that, there will be measures put in place to support, protect and ensure the needs of the child are met. 
uh, Siobhan. Thank you. Um, it was on, obviously, we've talked about the culture and um, we've talked about religion or faith um, and the practices to that. But as you know, when people are coming from other countries, um, they, they tend to live um, near one another um, in certain parts of Scotland. So I was just wondering if Police Scotland are targeting the resources in geographical areas um, or if it is a widespread um, approach across Scotland um, and taking that approach. Well, in, in terms of the broader child protection issue, all 14 um, divisions across Police Scotland have uh, public protection units with child protection officers based within those units. And they take slightly different shapes across the, 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 the country um, because of demand, because of uh, a number of issues. So there is um, a national standard for child protection that we want to drive out across Police Scotland to ensure that actually our practices are consistent across the country. Um, however, as you say, there's different communities, you know, uh, located in different areas of the, the country, and within those areas, of officers will have uh, different experiences, but they will be sufficiently resourced to deal with the child protection challenges in, in each area, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, another thing is, in your submission to us, um, you state that Police Scotland's view is that legislation alone will not eliminate FGM, and obviously you've repeated that um, in evidence today, but you also say there's a lack of knowledge and awareness of FGM, and that has to be tackled at a local and national level. So I was just wondering if you have any specific proposals for that, given that obviously we are doing an inquiry and we'll be calling on um, at some stage, um, I, would, I would hope, both uh, our local and, and national partners in the government um, to do something a bit more if, if necessary. So do you have anything specific that could help you um, as you as you do your work? Yeah, I think, uh, awareness raising is key. Um, within Police Scotland, we've set up a structure of three uh, uh, committees where our, we have a, a, a national working group where we have, uh, which is a strategic committee with partners from the government, uh, government uh, midwives, uh, health, procurator, fiscal attend that. So we're engaged there at awareness raising. We have a, a kind of divisional level. We have a national forum where we have uh, champions uh, within each division for HB, HBV, uh, force managing FGM, come together, we discuss pertinent issues, look about how we can improve practice, learn from each other's experiences across the country. And then we introduced a consultancy group with such a, third sector partners where we can um, canvas their views on particular topics and understand that. So um, absolutely not complacent. We also sit on uh, a number of groups, Scottish Government uh, uh, group on FGM, where we're study studying the intercollegiate recommendations um, to, to understand how they can be applied to Scotland. So I think awareness raising is key. Um, I think I, I would welcome anything that the committee can do to continue to drive awareness, continue to highlight the, the issue that is unacceptable in our society and that it, it is criminal behaviour. And actually, as a society, you know, we're going to challenge, address um, and hold people to account for those behaviours. Um, can I ask you, how long have the police been aware of FGM, not just Police Scotland, but police before they, they merged to Police Scotland? I, I think you have to go back to the 1985 legislation. Um, so we would have an awareness, certainly in 1985, of that legislation. So we, we would have had some level of awareness. I think that through those kind of 28 years, 29 years, that the level of awareness in line with other agencies, in line with society, in line with, you know, conventions, United Nations conventions, etc., our awareness has increased. So uh, for, for a significant number of years, we, we would have had a level of awareness. And has the, the, the previous organisations, police organisations, been as strongly focused as yourselves and adamant that it is child abuse and we're really keen to actually do something about it. Sorry, did you see other organisations uh, or no, other like the, pl the police the previous forces? Police Scotland, I, police I think force. It, um, it, it was dealt with under an ACPOS committee, so it was 
um, it, it, it was treated seriously. I, I think there's a real opportunity um, in, in moving to Police Scotland to drive out standards. There's an opportunity to revisit how we um, do our business, uh, an opportunity particularly around about child protection, and we're doing that. There's an opportunity about consistently measuring honour-based violence, forced marriage and FGM, um, and we've changed procedures. So I think those have been clear improvements. We have introduced a forced marriage protection register within the police, so we get, you know, that's how we know we had these 14 uh, uh, incidents affecting 16 children nationally, so we've got better recording mechanisms. Um, we've introduced a vulnerable persons database, which is not just about honour based violence, it's wider, it addresses adult concerns, child concerns. Um, um, domestic abuse, hate crime, <laughs> uh, youth offending. So this national database will capture our concerns around about uh, female genital mutilation as well. So there's, there, there is certainly merit in those national uh, procedures um, and processes that will contribute to our understanding of the extent and prevalence of FGM that's reported to the police. Yeah. And I, I definitely don't doubt Police Scotland and the previous forces commitments to actually eradicate this horrendous practice but what has been the barrier or the the gulf between yourselves and the other organisations to since 1985 not to have actually had any criminal convictions for it? I think I think there is a number of reasons I, I think um, um, and, and I think one of the fundamental reasons is entrenched in um, affected communities. It happens behind closed doors. It happens, it's a form of interfamilial uh, abuse often, uh, without um, a plethora of independent witnesses. Uh, it happens out with the country on occasion. Um, victims are, are children who are disempowered, who are in a very vulnerable uh, situation. Often the parents actually love their children. Uh, the children are loved by their parents. However, there is this one-off event of extreme violence that, that, that is unacceptable. All those issues combine to make reporting very, very difficult for a child affected. Um, there's a reluctance within communities where it's uh, practised in to expose that because it's an entrenched practice. So there are, there are a, a real number of barriers. And perhaps in 1985, when the law came into force, perhaps our understanding was that actually we'll, we'll introduce a law and, and that will solve the problem. Clearly that's not the case. You know, and, and we're, we're seeing that now. Enforcement and law enforcement is one part of that solution to FGM. Thank, thank you very much, uh, both of you, for coming along. Do any other committee members have any questions? No? Thank you very much. We will now suspend the meeting briefly um, to let the witnesses go and to organise ourselves for the next session. Thank you.
We now move to the second agenda item. Siobhan McMahon, MSP, will provide an update on disabled access to the Glasgow Commonwealth Games 2014 and feedback from a meeting held on the 3rd of June where myself and Siobhan met with David Grievenberg, the Chief Executive of Glasgow 2014. Um, can I now invite Siobhan to speak, please? Um, the meeting that we had was very productive. Um, obviously, as you know, um, we had concerns regarding the transport arrangements that we were already given, um, and so the venues in particular at Celtic Park um, and at Hamden and about the spaces that were left for blue badge holders um, specifically, and obviously um, the concern was that those with additional needs um, and not necessarily blue badge holders um, would not be catered for. Um, and I have to say... My opinion is, after after the meeting, that that's not the case, that Glasgow 2014 have been working um, since the start of last year, so January, February, um, on a programme of how they can deliver the Games for everyone and make it accessible, not only for those with a, a disability, but for the elderly, for, for those people who may be taking a pram or a buggy or have lots of children that have to go there, um, and the all volunteers that have been recruited um, by Glasgow 2014 have... Um, had additional training um, and so they, they will be aware um, of what to look for when people are using public transport if they see someone struggling um, as they're walking to the venue whatever that venue may be that they can then ask them certain questions and have um, a, an alternative route in place for them um, there was also specifically though 160 volunteers who have um, been given additional training um, and so they will specifically be at the venues um, so that people can refer on um, to them if, if they can't deal with um, the particular problem that they experience. And, I mean, one of the things that came up in discussion was, what if you break your leg a few weeks out or you know, whatever it may be that you might not necessarily have highlighted that that would be a concern for you. Um, but again, the view was of, of the committee that we met that they will be able to cater for that. And I think um, what was coming over very, very strongly was, yes, they had accessible tickets when you booked online and um, or on the phone and they asked those questions. But for those of us who may have been confused about that, and I certainly raised that, that did that mean that that was just if you had a blue badge or um, would that mean the rest of your party, would you be separated for them um, from them at the Games? Um, that's clearly not the case. They're trying to keep everyone together. Um, as much as possible. In fact, they said that if you had a carer, that they were getting a free ticket with you um, to go there. But even if you didn't have an accessible ticket, when you receive your tickets now uh, in the booking pack, you can then phone the booking line and, and suggest um, that you may have additional needs, uh, not necessarily with the ticket, but walking to the ground, whatever that may be. And they would give um, uh, as much practical information and help um, as they could. Um, the other thing I think to mention was the traffic management plans because I had, I had raised that specifically about Motherwell, obviously, and the train station that's been used there and, um, and obviously, the flow of traffic coming through. Um, they said that they would work with the traffic management plans and local authorities in, in those instances. They didn't foresee any problems at the moment, but if anyone had concerns, that they can flag them up as, as go and, and they will try their best to address them um, as we continue. Um, b before before the game starts. So, um, it, for me, the impression wasn't that this was a final thing. They have come up with their plan and they're not prepared to move it. If there are additional concerns, they will look at those things um, and continue um, in, in best practice. I think what was coming across strongly was that they've seen this as their legacy as well. For They've learned from the Olympics, they've learned from the Paralympics. They want all venues to be accessible going forward so that anyone can use sporting venues. Um, we spoke about Toe Cross Swimming Pool and how um, they have adapted that for um, disabled use um, going on and, and how that should be the, the benchmark for the rest of the pools in Scotland um, to be used and, um, with the dignity, and frankly, that they're shown. And, and obviously, Convener, you raised the issue about the elderly using that and obviously going forward about how um, and our growing health needs um, that, that people are asked to be using swimming and various other things, so how accessible will that be? And, and the Chief Exec thought that that could be the legacy of the Games also and that they would try and share best practice where possible. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think that will leave it there. OK, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, we, we did find the, the meeting really, really informative and they seem to have sort of pre-empted every sort of 
possibility of problems, concerns, and, and Siobhan was really good because she spoke from her own point of view of also applying for tickets as well. So that was great for us because we could s sort of walk in her shoes, so to speak, going through the whole process. So, yeah, and I think there'll be a great legacy, hopefully left, um, particularly when we're talking about the swimming pools as well and the facilities that they're put in so that people can actually use them. Um, without drawing attention to themselves and, 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 and keep themselves healthy. So, thank you very much, Siobhan. Uh, John, would you like to ask a question? Uh, yes, thank you. And uh, I don't know if I'm meant to declare an interest. I'm actually a volunteer at the Games, uh, as a Clyde Sider, as is termed. <laughs> so, uh, that's given me the advantage of having been through some of the training. Um, and a lot of that was very positive. I mean, we had discussions, for example, you know, some people in a wheelchair like you to be at the same level as them when you're speaking to them and some people don't like that when you're speaking to them so you know we've been at that kind of level and actually discussing being sensitive to people and so on which I think has been helpful another one that came up was they're expecting a lot more children at the venues than you would normally get and families will be able to bring prams not take them right into the venue but have a place uh, in the perimeter where they can be left uh, so things like that that I might not have expected I mean, one of the points, uh, Siobhan, that you make uh, is that uh, information was available. And I, there's just a slight question over that, because if they've made information available and then people haven't kind of taken it up, uh, could there be problems kind of on the day? I mean, I actually met a volunteer who had uh, made it clear when he was initially interviewed that he had a disability. But when he came along to one of the training events, he hadn't highlighted it and they hadn't kind of picked it up. So I'm just wondering, although information is available, I just wonder if they were able to reassure you that people, you know, they felt people were taking it on board kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, I think that was one of the points I made, that it wasn't clear when you were online when trying to book your tickets what was accessible and what, what did that mean. Mm -hmm. um, and having received tickets now, um, I'm not quite sure that if we hadn't had that meeting that I would have known specifically what to do. So they said that they would look at different ways of how they can do that, and not necessarily on the website either, because mm -hmm. not everyone has access um, to the computer. So I was reassured, however, like anything, there is still a concern over that. And I think the backup was that the training that, that you and, and others have had um, would be sufficient to do that now. Um, you're, you'll know better than I if that is the case. Um, I suppose we'll only know when it's taken place, but I wouldn't think there was any complacency um, in, in the meeting we had. Every concern that we raised would be addressed, um, is, is what I got back, and that they will continue that dialogue. So if, if you still have concerns over that, I'm sure that we can raise that um, and highlight it with them again. But certainly, yeah, I, I, th I thought they did address that. And they, were, they were very, very keen to, if the, which one was saying, if there's any issues that we can bring up, that they're really keen to address it. It's not uh, a line drawn in the sand. They will keep reviewing and updating their systems and procedures accordingly. I mean, I mean, I was, I'm, I'm positive, very positive about the games, and um, I mean, I think the venues are, it looks like are going to be very well staffed because you've got full-time paid staff, stewards, and things, and you've got the volunteers as well, and that should hopefully, when, because inevitably things will come up, people take ill at the time, uh, that will be um, hopefully handled well. Uh, and just the other point. I noticed from your report that they're going to they gave an undertaking to provide the committee with human resources figures and equalities yeah. and so on, which is good. I, I just wonder if that will include the kind of background of people who are volunteering and involved. Um, you know, that have we really got a cross section of society involved uh, in in volunteering uh, from both better off and less well off uh, backgrounds? We can certainly ask for that information. Yeah. At the time, a general question, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, Ma Margaret do. certainly led on that. I am, and they said that they would look in um, and, go, and go back to their HR department to ask the questions because they didn't have that information with them because obviously they were dealing primarily with the accessibility issue. Um, so they said that they would look at it and see how they came across the questions because Margaret had also asked about the volunteers and specifically young people yeah. where volunteers will 
what happens after the games if, if they've got particular skills will they be referred to certain companies um, who are looking more the job fairs etc and how will that be highlighted and again the chief exec said that yes that's what they were hoping to do and because obviously the company is now winding down as guards of 2014 because obviously the game will, will be taking place and, and over um, quite soon so they're winding down but they hope that everyone um, who has who has a, a skill can be referred on um, and but certainly they said they would come back but as I said, uh, Margaret done that as convener. I mean, that's a good point as well, because yesterday there was that uh, the Youth uh, Link event mm -hmm. and I was speaking to the Scouts. Now, for example, they're not allowed to have a list of the volunteers and they were quite hopeful that maybe some of the volunteers would then want to go on and help mm -hmm. the Scouts uh, longer term. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, I mean, uh, I accept that maybe that information can't be given to the Scouts, but, you know, maybe the Scouts would, or, and other groups would be able to kind of s send in information which could then be disseminated to the volunteers. Yeah. I mean, you probably will be able to sort of comment on this as well, that the the benefits and the experience and the skills that the volunteers are actually gaining uh, by, by doing this during the Commonwealth Games is a fantastic experience for them to actually put on their CVs and help them to move into employment if they've been unemployed for a certain period of time. And that and is something that is something yeah, yes. that is something we've got to make sure that we can capture that that at the end of the, the Commonwealth Games and the volunteering period, they just don't drop off an edge and go back into being unemployed and signing on again. That they are actually moved on into through their choice, training, employment or further education. And therefore, that's mm -hmm. partly why I'm asking, you know, yep. how many mm -hmm. unemployed people did they actually get as yep. volunteers? And yep. can we learn from that in the future? Yeah, we'll get that information. Thank you. Anybody else get any questions? No? No. Oh, John. John, finish. Just thank yourself, Siobhan, and, and John, for the input. It was very uh, helpful. And I, and I think it's certainly the, the, back to our previous item, it's the attitudinal change that might be built into some of these things that will reap rewards in the future. So thank you for that. Uh, I think as well... Uh, I will say thanks to Siobhan as well because she made it really very sort of visual for us um, in describing what it was like when she was actually applying for tickets and the issues that she came up against, which then gave them the opportunity to explain really clearly that the systems and procedures they actually had in place to sort of deal with any of the issues. So that was really good. So thanks very much. OK, so we'll now move on to Agenda 3 is consideration of a response from the Scottish Government on the gypsy travellers in care um, and where gypsy travellers live in Quire. We will also consider correspondence from the stakeholders, which is paper three. Uh, we're asked to discuss whether we want to request proposed timelines from the Scottish Government for the working groups and whether to request further information in the proposed framework for gypsy travellers accommodation. Um, and whether we want to look at a later date when we would like to seek further evidence from stakeholders looking specifically at timelines proposed. Anybody get any comments they would like to make? John. Well, um, my frustration knows no bounds on this issue, so I'll be very, very uh, brief. Um, I would think you will find it challenging to get any meaningful engagement from um, some of the stakeholders who are sick to death have been asked questions, giving answers, and then being ignored. So um, I would just encourage some genuine action from uh, the people who have received this report, because nothing has changed, and uh, I primarily attitudes haven't changed at, at all. Christian, maybe a good idea to have COSLA and seeing uh, how we can sort out the problem of local authorities. We see that uh, in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, uh, we seem to have uh, a lot of problems there. And it, it doesn't seem to be either kicking in the long grass or maybe taking back <coughs> measures which are not helping at all. So it may be a good idea to have a wide view of the local authorities and see if COSLA will be happy to come uh, and speak to us about it. John. Yeah, yeah, I have to say, um, uh, you know, I echo these views. I'm very disappointed that you know we're possibly talking a, a further delay of two years when it, I thought it had been widely agreed that there was a need for more sites. I know it's a sensitive issue, but I, I just find it incredibly disappointing that uh, this is the case. Um, 
Siobhan, then Alex. Thank you. Um, just on the, the reports that we have received back, I think the frustration is that there is no time frames, and I'm pleased that we are going to ask about them because I think we've given long enough to see what meaningful engagement is going to take place. And I think, you know, NECOP have, have highlighted the fact that they have a gypsy traveller working group now with no gypsy travellers on it. I mean, I think that's incredible that we're at that stage. Um, and, I, and I don't see how um, the government or COSLA or anyone can, can think that that's a, a good and meaningful thing to do. Um, I think it's a slap in the face, actually, to all those who have worked in, in both reports, who have given evidence to this committee. Um, and I think it's shocking that we're going down the same path as we have over the last um, decade um, in this parliament. Um, the other things are, when there's an update, um, as in the report, when they talked about handheld records, you know, there is no information as to why that's the case. That, so some people said that they wouldn't work, therefore it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Well, who are the people? What was the meaningful engagement? How did that go about? Um, did we listen to both sides of the argument? You know, there is, there's no evidence as to, to why that is the case. Um, and they also, uh, in the government's report, speak about the Children and Young People's Bill. Well, it's now being enacted, so, so when, are we, when are we using things? What are the time frames going forward? Because they speak about it coming forward and they hope for it well. It's now in place. Obviously, it's just in place. We wouldn't have expected that piece of legislation um, to bring about great changes at this time. But what are the time frames going forward about that piece of legislation um, and not simply use it as a headline? Yeah. Um, Thank you very much. Alex? I was entertained by John's comment a minute ago where he talked about two years being an unacceptable timescale. Two years is a blink of an eye in the way this has been dealt with up to now. They, there is a, a serious problem highlighted by this uh, and what has gone before it for the whole time this Parliament's existed and possibly before that. There is uh, a desire to follow the accepted route that we will consult, we will include, we will do all that things. And we've been round the circle so often that uh, I, th I think it becomes clear that it's not working. Uh, I think what this needs is leadership. Uh, and what we need to do is encourage uh, those who are in a position uh, to demonstrate that leadership to do so. Now, that will involve a time scale. Uh, we, we need to, to try and set a time scale on this. But I, I would like to see uh, a government minister allow this to come to the top of their entry and stay there for a while rather than be buried. Uh, I understand that Shona Robeson is now the minister uh, with this responsibility. Uh, she's got a number of responsibilities, but the Commonwealth Games will soon be over. Uh, and I would like to challenge Shona to make this her next priority after that. So, anyone else? Marco. I, I agree with that sentiment as well as bringing Causal here. I think we should bring the, the, the Cabinet Secretary. Um, as with all things timetable-wise, it would have to be in the autumn, but I think there would also be value in announcing well in advance that that invitation was there so that it's something that she, both she and hopefully COSLA would have in their diaries and would have as a, a, a focus for, for action to get something at least achieved before then so that they can come to the committee and point to at least some movement from their respective areas of responsibility. Would you be happy with if we initially wrote to the government and COSLA, ask them to send us details of their timelines and then also bring them in to speak to them? Yeah. So send out the letter just now and we'll then bring them in after recess. Yeah. Agreed? Agreed. Okay. Um, that's us, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Agenda four. Um, is a discussion on petition PE1372 by Friends of the Earth Scotland on access to justice in environmental matters, which is paper four. Taking into account the work done by the Justice Committee relevant to this petition, I'm asked news to consider whether we should close the petition or take another course of action. John Finney. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I, I think this was um, the Aarhus Convention, or reference there to, appeared at one of the very first um, 
um, seeing Siobhan, who's been here, I think, with me on the committee throughout that period, um, items that, that came to this committee, uh, and it has been batted around. Now, it will be a matter of fine judgment whether there is compliance in some instances and not in others, and it's entirely right to say a lot of this work um, would appear to be addressed by the um, Justice Committee. Similarly, you could have said the important item we had today, female genital mutilation, is a, is a crime, so that would be the Justice Committee too. But I, I think there is a role for this committee, and uh, I think prior to making a decision on it, I would like us to uh, write to the Scottish Government asking them whether they believe there is compliance, how they would evidence that compliance, if there isn't compliance, where the shortfalls are and how they seek to address that. Um, and significantly, the party of government had as a manifesto commitment a commitment to an environmental court. So I think similarly, it would be interesting to know where that matter it does sit. This came to, uh, was directly referred to in the Justice Committee's uh, report on court reform, where the, the, the Justice Committee did say they would welcome uh, uh, um, uh, or that that legislation would facilitate an environmental court. Now, that doesn't appear to be on the agenda. We did write um, to, to the Minister about or that was addressed in the response to the Stage 1 report. But I, I think this committee has a, 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 an obligation to look at the wider aspects, if you like, the non-judicial aspects, aspects, but how, how it affects the much-used term access to justice. And I think if we were to write on the specifics that I outline, that we could make a, an informed decision thereafter. I just entirely agree with John. I think John has been going um, from from the very first days of, of this committee and in, in, in this session of Parliament, and and I think um, for our committee not to have looked at it um, in its entirety, I think would be wrong before closing the petition and writing to the Scottish Government is what I had wrote in my notes also. So so I fully back uh, John in his proposal. Christian. I'm, I'm not particularly in argument with John. I'm just wondering. I, I see that uh, it's, it was in the Justice Committee as it was talked about, and um, the government did answer that it should maybe be taken by a, an environmental committee because it's high for justice to so environment. I, I don't know really how, it is sit, how does it sit in this committee. But uh, that will be my oh, view. John Finney. Well, it is, um, it is the, the, the equality of the opportunity to challenge decisions. So, for instance, the ability of, of a small community to take on a multinational about an issue and where that sits. Um, um, but, uh, you know, whatever has gone on at other committees, we, we, don't, we don't have anything here about that. I'm giving you my interpretation of events there. And I think we meet, you know, if, if the desire is to close the loop from this committee's point of view, then I think there is no harm in securing that information first, and then we can have a debate thereafter. John Mason. Um, yes, I mean, I, I don't have any problem with us uh, asking about it or writing about it, whatever we're going to do. I mean, I think when I read the figure, and I, mean, I suppose coming from a finance background, you know, as soon as I see more legal aid possibly going to one group, I wonder, does that mean there's less legal aid going to another group? And obviously people like homeless and that area, uh, already there's an issue. Sometimes people not getting the legal aid that they feel they should. So I think that, that would, I would just flag that up. That was one of my concerns. Any other comments? Yeah. No. No. We've got to be very careful. You know, some people, for example, in Aberdeen, would say that the balance went the wrong way when we're talking about the ADUPR. So, you know, it, it's in both ways, like, like, like John said. Alex. I'm saying nothing because I agree with Christian, and I think if I said that publicly, it might weaken his case. <laughs> <laughs> John Finney. Yeah, no, I, I think it's an interesting discussion because, of course, it does throw the whole question of budgets open. And, and, you know, what, what, what a quality impact assessment has been made about the budgetary allocation for legal aid. I absolutely agree with it. It's a fundamental thing that we have to wrestle with every day at this place, is if you have a fixed budget, then it's competing demands. But then th there still is, and we would as a committee expect there to be evidence as to how one demand trumps another demand. Um, and um, I, I don't see any difficulty for the committee or indeed the government <coughs> outlining the position. We'll be happy to go along with John Finney's suggestion that we write to the government, ask for an explanation, and then we decide when we get the reply back what we decide, what we're going to do. Do we close or do we do further action? Yes? Yes. Okay.
that's lovely. Thank you very much. That's confirmed. Um, the final item, oh no, that concludes the actual public part of today's meeting. And our next meeting will actually take place on Thursday the 14th of August. I now suspend the meeting to move into private. Thank you. <laughs>